Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This lecture will have some new material in it. It's not official objectivism. I think it's consistent with official objectivism. And it's a it's conclusions that I've reached inductively through arguing about some of the concrete areas of regulation with other objectivists and many of the uh, ideas that I've kind of put together into one package here were actually suggested to me by others. So I can't take credit for the origination of the uh, ideas that I will, um, in particular on one slide, uh, show you as the climax here, but um, nevertheless, it should be an informative even though I didn't originate, it still should be informative. Go figure. <laughs> the reason this is the cover of the paperback edition of Anthem in the early years, the one that I read in 1962, and I've always loved it, even though there are certain things not to like about it, but the basic conception, I think, is really terrific. And it shows, if you can't see the detail, uh, a bunch of more or less faceless people in a crowd who are chained and one man who's broken his chains is reaching for a star, a shiny object uh, above him. Uh, and uh, that is kind of what the talk will end up as saying. First, let's begin as is customary with a quote from Ayn Rand. The principles, the theory, and the actual practice of capitalism rest on a free, unregulated market. Now, of course, this is talking about the market, not about every aspect of uh, government and the individual, but rumor has it that a free mind and a free market are corollaries. So I think this does apply to every aspect of um, a capitalist society. And I want to say a word about methodology here. When I, I had some difficulty in my thinking about this originally because I could think of regulations that didn't seem to fit the uh, attack I was trying to launch. There seemed to be some regulations that were not uh, rulable out, rule outable on the grounds that I'm given. But then I realized, no, don't be a conservative, Harry. Be an objectivist. If you find that you're dealing with, well, some of these things are good and some of these are bad, question your concepts. You have to craft your concepts. What is and is not regulation is not set by God. It is a concept created by man. So you have to form your concepts in a way that does not package together proper and improper things. Your concepts dividing line have to be drawn so as to isolate fundamental similarities from fundamental differences. Whoop, I went too far. So first of all, since this is inductive, what are we talking about that I put together? Environmental regulations, building codes, elevator inspections, all the petty stuff and not so petty uh, associated with that. FDA controls, which, you know, is a big uh, issue. It's killed hundreds of millions of people, in my view, and certainly millions in the um, COVID uh, around the world and killed maybe half a million Americans. Immigration controls and gun control. Just having this list of things together gives you a kind of new perspective on uh, all of them. So those are some of the concretes to have in mind, and what is the context for our discussion of this? The context is 
political philosophy, right? And what is, in each of the branches of philosophy, you should have one or two words, words denoting concepts that you hold in mind in discussing any issue in that um, branch. And in political philosophy, the two words that would come automatically to your mind are? Burr, 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 burr. <laughs> Did somebody say property? That's wrong. Force and rights, the two sides of the same coin. Non-initiation of force and the protection of individual rights, which are just kind of two ways of saying the same thing. Okay, so that's the context we want to hold. The next question is, what is regulation? And I, I thought the definition was going to be a revelation, but it's, it's actually very obvious and prosaic. Government regulation is state control over a given field of action whereby government officials dictate who may do what in that field. The only kind of interesting thing is you don't tend to think of regulation of a field as government control of it, but it is because, as we'll get to the meaning, what is the meaning of that thing? Politically, it means you have no right to liberty. It means that engaging in that activity is not a matter of right. It's something that the government permits you to do or doesn't permit you to do. So that's a formula for total control of that activity. It may not exercise that total control yet. The FDA may not tell you everything that you must do and must not do in regard to your health, but it could and it will unless reversed. Legally, regulation means preventive law. That's Ayn Rand's point. Preventive law, and that is the crux of the issue. Morally, regulation means sacrifice. Sacrifice of what to what? Well, of the innovator to the stagnant, think of Frank Lloyd Wright trying to build the uh, Johnson's Wax Building in Racine, Ohio. He had a novel design where it would, the building would float kind of on some special new design supports that are beautiful. And the building inspectors wouldn't let him do it. He eventually got enough publicity by sitting under these supports with five times the weight they were to bear in the building, sitting, reading a newspaper or something happily under it, watching them support that way, that he was allowed to do it. But in every case, government regulations stop innovation or slow it down significantly. It's the regulations sacrifice the productive to the parasites. Think of all the feather bedding regulations that the unions have backed by uh, government power. It would be all right if they were private, but they wouldn't be able to have feather bedding if it weren't uh, for the government's power. Think of the teachers union deciding, no, we're not going to go back to school. We like being on vacation like this. Uh, no, we're not going back to school. The teachers who want to teach can't because of regulations. The unions have the power. The governments own the school. Of the rational to the irrational, the most interesting to me, if you look at medical regulations, for example, <clears throat> why do we have an FDA? Why do we license doctors? And by we, I mean the government. Well, if you didn't have medical regulations, people would be taking all kinds of snake oil remedies and hurting themselves. And if you didn't license doctors, people would be going to uh, quacks and having surgery they didn't need and be destroying themselves. Oh yeah, what people? You? 
No, not me, but the, you know, the, the masses, the irrational people. So we can't make our own decisions because other people would make irrational decisions. So all have to be stopped so that the irrational don't get the consequences of their own irrationality. It's a sacrifice of the rational to the irrational. And if you get to environmental regulations, it's of man to mud. Okay, here's the problem. We say the government is in charge of retaliatory force. Uh, I'm not sure to call it a problem. Here's the issue. Retaliation is after the fact. So you objectivists are saying, oh, after you're murdered, then you can have the police come. What good does that do to the murder victim? Yeah, you're damn right that's what we're saying, unless you want to go to jail right now for the murder you might commit. Retaliation is after the fact, but there does seem to be perhaps some scope or issue where you don't want to wait until after the fact. Basically, yes. Bite the bullet. Retaliation is against those who have started the use of force. Uh, but still, the threat of force is force. When you draw the gun and point it, that's where force has begun. Right? So the threat of force is force. 99% of the force wielded against us is threats. I don't think you've had a policeman come to your house, for instance, and twist your arm to sign your tax return. You face the threat of force, but you're forced because the threat of force is force. So even though retaliation is act after the fact, sometimes it's after the fact of threat to stop that threat. But what counts as a threat? This is the whole issue. What counts as a threat? And this is the new material. Objective threats count as threats. What makes a threat objective? There has to be objective evidence that Material damages are in the offing. Not, well, he looked at me funny. Not even fighting words. You know the doctrine of fighting words? If you go into a bar in a rough neighborhood, the proverbial, you know, Western saloon type of bar, a tough bar, and you start saying, your mother wears combat boots or whatever, at a certain point it's considered fighting words, you're, you're threatening the person. But that's not true. There has to be objective evidence like you start leaning into him and you cock your fist or you say, I'm going to punch your face in. Some kind of objective evidence of a clear and present danger, not I'm going to get you for this someday. A clear and present danger, that's, you know, legal language that's already in existence. Now we get to the more interesting parts. Of a specific harm, not something bad is going to be, he's going to do something bad to me. Tomorrow at noon, whatever. It has to be a specific harm. Two specific individuals. Oh, now we're getting somewhere. Two specific individuals. Not to the public interest. Not to society. Not to, quote, public health. But to specific individuals. Posed by specific acts. Not, well, he's going out in public without wearing a mask, and that increases the chances of somebody getting 
COVID somewhere that he might pass of specific individuals, the person not wearing the mask. So it's two, some specific guy is going to be harmed by some specific guy. Not, well, if everyone in the population is forced to wear masks, then the average number of cases will go down. That is completely improper. That is not in accordance with capitalism, individual rights, countering the threat of force, or in my view, the Constitution. And you see how th this throws a completely different perspective on it throughout this pandemic. The idea has been, how can we get the numbers down? What does government have to do to get the numbers down? That is, the numbers are not the issue. Legally, this is known by a kind of vague word, probable cause. It's in the Constitution. The Fourth Amendment says that no warrants shall be issued except on probable cause by oath or aff affirmation. Uh, and it goes on to talk about the specific of specific uh, wrongs. I think it's, it's a short phrase that means what I just said. That is what the previous slide, all these things I think are in, involved in there being probable cause, which means the police can be called. Now if there's a typhoid Mary, or a, a COVID uh, Connie, and you know she's got COVID, and she's going out, to uh, a party or something, uh, maybe the people at the party consent, but she's going out on a public street and she's kissing people she meets or something. You can stop that, you can quarantine her, but you can only do it if there's evidence that she's got COVID, she's not voluntarily staying at home, and there's specific people that you're talking about her infecting as, you, as the police observe her. I don't think that's ever going to happen in COVID. It happened with HIV, if you remember. At a certain point, people who were infected with it deliberately like, got their blood, through their blood on people to infect them and in a hostile, malicious, criminal act. Do you remember that? That was known. Um, so it, that is the proper role of government. The proper role of government is if somebody maliciously or even negligently threatens the rights of other, of specific other people, he's initiating force against them and the police should intervene. It is not the government's role to have anything to do with health per se. Um, Amish uh, properly referred to something I hadn't thought of, which is bioterrorism from fi uh, foreign nations. He, he mentioned typhoid Mary as a proper uh, Amish adalja, the doctor that lectured here a couple of days ago, infectious disease expert, for those who may not know who I'm talking about. And he uh, properly said, you can quarantine typhoid Mary. And then he added what I hadn't thought of, bioweapons from foreign nations. But that's not public health. That's military preparedness. Like when they threaten to shoot you with bullets from a foreign aggressor, you don't say, well, this is the metal controls issue. It's a, it's a foreign army engaging in war against you. The specific means it uses does not, is not particularly relevant. You're protected against all damage caused by people trying to initiate force against you, violate your rights. It's not, there's no role for government in something called public health. So I think probable cause uh, is really what it comes down to. You cannot 
act. The government cannot. We can. They can. The government can't act against you without probable cause. So the police can retaliate against an objective threat where they have probable cause. And this is the way things were understood in the past, and it's been lost today, this whole concept. There's another thing that people sort of know about, but is not in the forefront of their consciousness. This pertains to things like building codes. If you think the building going up next door to you is rickety and a strong wind is going to blow it over onto your building, your house, you can go to court, and if you can prove it, you can get what's called an injunction, which means the person has to stop. This is still after the fact, after you've proved a threat. In this case, it's not a malicious threat. It's a threat from negligent action. But you can go to court if you can prove by objective means that this specific individual is going to inflict a specific harm or subject you to an unacceptable risk of a specific harm, you can stop it. It's hard to get injunctions. It's harder to get an injunction than to win a lawsuit after the fact. And that's correct. That should, that's the way it should be. You have to have a pretty good solid case that this is something is wrong in what he's doing in order to stop him. But keep that in mind. So when we say retaliation is after the fact, a threat is when it's present is force. And one of the means of stopping that threat is going to court. Now this is the other big point. There's no collective guilt. The individual has free will. That means he is not stained by the sins, the wrongdoings, the harms, the crimes of others. Now you would recoil in horror if someone's brother and uncle were picked up and thrown in jail because the person of whom they are the uncle and brother had committed a crime, say he robbed a liquor store. So let's pick up all the members of the family. After all, they have the same genes pretty much. So maybe they have the criminal gene. There is no criminal gene. And the other people are not responsible for what he did unless they conspired with him to do it, which is a different case. Now, this has big, big implications for immig immigration controls. But it has big, big implications for all the collective regulations that forbid some people to do things because others have done bad things. So now we get to the applications. And I have in gray the criteria that I came up with. Environmental regulations, well, they're a non-starter because there's no harm. Harm means harm to specific individuals. And there's no harm, there's only harm to the environment. If you can prove in court that somebody dumping uh, waste into his backyard is seeping into your water table, well, then you sue for an injunction to be compensated for the harm they may already have done. So this doesn't remove your rights to sue if some specific individual does something uh, against you. But it does stop this mass collective control by an agency of every step we take. Building codes. Contrary to popular belief, people don't want their buildings to fall down. It's not like, you know, when a uh, builder finds that his building is collapsed, he dances in joy and says, boy, finally I got what I wanted. All those people killed and so forth. Builders want their buildings to stand and 
in a free society, insurance companies would have very rigorous inspections to see that they're done correctly because of their selfish greed, the greed of the insurance companies. And if you see something wrong, you can sue. If you can prove it, you can get an injunction. But the purpose of the building inspector is basically to take bribes. And I think we can do without that. Medical controls. Now, this is a big subject on which I'm very passionate. Medical controls have shortened all of our lifespan, I think, centuries. Because I think if there hadn't been any medical controls over the 20th century, we would by now have the uh, same immortality that the cancer cells that you may have in you have. Did you know the cancer cells are immortal? And certain species of animal. But that's another subject. At minimum, we know that they have slowed the rate of progress tremendously. The average time that it takes to get a drug approved, if it's going to be approved, is 10 years. Now, about a year and a half would be required to, for the company to approve it, because they don't want to be destroyed by letting out a drug that hurts people. But eight and a half years and a billion dollars to produce a new drug. I mean, that, that's incalculably slow. Imagine in computers, before you could write a new program, you had to submit that program to a government bureau to make sure it's safe and effective. And the hardware, same thing for the hardware. Oh, no, we can't. We can't. These computers are going to go in the home. We can't let that happen. You laugh, but hearing aids, which are the same thing as the earbuds that go in your ears, have been illegal uh, uh, you know, to be sold on the market. You have to go through procedures and audiologists and get a prescription and so forth. So they cost $5,000. Do you know how much they would cost if there weren't regulations? Well, I happen to know because I know someone who worked for Sarnoff and developed a cheap hearing aid, $50. That's Sarnoff Labs. We're not talking about Joe's fly-by-night uh, ear device. But, and then well, people will tell you if you say, well, no, but you don't understand that hearing loss is in different frequencies and some people have unusual conditions. Yeah. And just as they don't hear so well through their earbuds, they wouldn't hear so well through their uh, $50 hearing aids. And if they're dissatisfied, they get a different one or set the dial differently. I have some hearing uh, assisting thing in my bag that I didn't take out, made by Bose for $300. And it works with my iPhone. I can set the treble and I can set the localization. And anything that you can do with, you know, earbuds, you can do with a, a, a hearing aid. But no, we can't have that. We can't have, because people would shove things into their ears and break their eardrums. <laughs> you know, it would be a disaster if it's not absolutely perfect. If it only improves your hearing to the point where you're satisfied for $50, that's not good enough because the audiologist may determine that you have a hearing loss in an area that you don't even notice. Wait, you don't even notice? Then why do I need it corrected if I don't even notice it? I mean, you can buy glasses at the dime store for what we used to call the dime store, which I have in my pocket for two for $9.00. And nobody says, well, I mean, I guess people do say it. You have to have these checked by an optometrist who's licensed by the state because otherwise you might not see real well through them. Yeah, I don't see real well through them, but it's better than not having them. So there's, medical controls are based upon the sacrifice 
of the rational to the irrational, of throttling medical progress, and they're like the worst controls there are, but I have to go on. Immigration controls. Now, I'm talking about <clears throat> in a free society, in a laissez-faire country, because you can argue about should there be some controls today <clears throat> when supposedly immigrants come in to get welfare. I don't think they do, but some people think they do. And where you, there could be a threat of terrorists coming in. I don't think there's a threat, but some people do. And I don't want to debate that because the principle is, <clears throat> if you're talking about a, a non-welfare state with a rational foreign policy, that we want to get to in, you know, maybe two or three years, <laughs> there can't be any immigration controls in that society. There can't be any. And the idea that, well, you know, Mexicans have rapists and criminals in it, that's arresting the brother and the uncle for the crimes of the person. What other Mexicans have done is no reflection and no reason to violate the rights of those who have not committed a crime. I mean, would you go into a slum neighborhood like Harlem used to be in New York and start rounding up people because a lot of them are criminal? The, the, the crime rate is very high in some neighborhoods. You probably know which neighborhoods in your city is a high crime rate. So let's have the police go in there and demand a vetting of everybody and have someone supervise their every step. That's called a police state. So the idea of no collective guilt means, even if you are talking about people from lower, lower Slobovia where there's a high crime rate, you can't stop the innocent. You can't interfere in any way with the freedom of travel of the innocent because some people who look like them are guilty. Now, I, I just want to say one other thing. There's this argument that even in a free society, you'd have the right to stop criminals. <clears throat> Sounds good. Yeah, yeah, if you could do that, you would have the right. I mean, criminals have no rights, right? <clears throat> but what do you mean by a criminal? Well, someone who's committed a crime in his native country. <clears throat> what happened? Was he arrested? If so, did he go to jail? If so, did he break out of jail or did he serve his time? Well, in this country, our own ex-cons, we don't say you have no rights. We let them back into society. They paid their debt. So why wouldn't the same thing be true of an Englishman or a Costa Rican who has served his time. Otherwise, what do you mean when you, when you say criminal? Oh, well, this is the kind of guy who would do something. Uh-huh. That's preventive law. So the principle of um, what we should do at the border is the same as the principle of what we should do on Gu Guadalupe Street out here. You don't stop people coming across Guadalupe Street because they might be criminals. Because some criminals in the past have crossed Guadalupe Street. There's no difference in the rights of people, whether they're citizens or non-citizens. Basic individual rights are possessed by man qua man, not by man qua American or Englishman or whatever it is. So. You cannot do to someone crossing from the border things that you do not do to people within the heartland of your country. <clears throat> Thank you. So the idea of, you know, well, we'll, we'll vet for criminals, you know, I believe that for like 50 years. But then when you try and concretize it, what does that mean? Well, it means people who are ex-cons. That's all it really means. Because the number of fugitives, yes, 
If Mexico sends you a list, these are the three people who have broken out of jail in the last six months, yeah, you could arrest them and give them back to Mexico, and you should. But otherwise, a criminal is someone who's been released, who's an ex-con, and you can't give them less rights than you do our ex-cons because they're from a different country. I'm sure there'll be objections in the question period. I'm happy to deal with them. But be aware, you people who don't like immigration. Other people don't like guns. <laughs> you probably like guns. Now here, this is one of the two areas in which there is ex explicit objectivist doctrine. The explicit objectivist doctrine is we have no explicit objectivist doctrine. <laughs> so Ayn Rand specifically stated that she has not studied the, the topic and she has no position. Do you know what the other one is where there's no, there's a validly no position? Death penalty. Morally, we have this position. Morally, a murderer deserves to die. But legally, there's the issue of mistakes, and a lot of them have been made. And so the question is, can you, can you formulate a standard of evidence that would be virtually mistake-proof? We haven't, and short of that, it's, it's, the argument is it's too risky to have a death penalty given the mistakes. And you see all the DNA projects that have found release innocent people. So on that topic too, objectivism hasn't made up its collective mind. <laughs> uh, so gun control is something that I think, I changed my mind when I came to understand immig uh, immigration and the general argument against regulation. So the fact that somebody takes a gun and shoots up a school is no evidence that I'm going to take my gun and shoot up anybody. None. There's no connection. And you cannot forbid guns to the innocent because some people use guns to commit horrible crimes. Nor is it practical, but we'll, we won't go into that. So immigration controls and gun controls are both the same preventive law. They both say the innocent can't do what they should be, we think they should be able to do, because there are guilty people, because others have done wrong. And uh, that's, uh, collectivism is wrong. No collective guilt, the individual has free will, he is not stained with the sins of others. You are not staying with the sins of the Parkland shooters. And go look, go to an airport where they uh, come across, you know, international flights. Those people are not stained with any uh, crimes that you may see on Fox News. Oh, this guy has been deported and come back 16 times. He's murdered four people, raped eight women. Okay. I'm, I'm sure somebody has, but what has that got to do with the guy coming into uh, JFK from somewhere who's a foreigner? Nothing. One thing that feeds into regulation is the Christian view of man. And I think it's not even the religious view of man. I think it's specifically the Christian view, but I'm willing to be corrected. But I don't think like Buddhists, maybe it's also Islamic. Uh, I don't think that even the Jewish view is this bad. St. Augustine, they made him a saint because he confessed. He said he, he was, but this is man in his view, crooked and defiled, but spotted and ulcerous. That's the view of man. Now, if man were this way, or like the next quote I'm going to show you, it would kind of make sense to restrain him. He's a beast. He's a loath, loathsome thing who's out of control. Only who, who are you going to do, who are you going to get to restrain him? Well, we'll vote on that. <laughs> Pope Innocent III, the most ill-named person in history, 
wrote On the Misery of Man, and just from memory, because I've quoted so many times, Why are you proud, O mud? Who are you that you should boast? Oh, the vile ignominy of human existence. Oh, the ignominious vileness of human existence. He plays with the words. He loves what he's saying. If, if you were talking about pit bulls, out of control, no free will, and so forth, and if there were another race of men, it would make sense, I guess, to have one restrain the other, but to have the same masses vote to enslave themselves. Yeah, I'm voting, I'm voting Democratic because I don't want people like me to be able to make choices. That way, you know, I know from introspection that that way is death. So in Anthem, we come back. In Anthem, equality 72521 swept and imprisoned. Why? For the sin of innovation. And that's the worst aspect of all these regulations, particularly the medical. They're killing us. They're sending us to an early grave. They're depriving us of our future. And it's all summed up in this picture. That's the chains of the regulations. And if you can break through, free of them, you can reach for the stars. Thank you. Thank you. I left extra time for questions because this is a topic that really lends itself to a lot of concrete uh, questions, and I hope I have the answers. First question. Thank you, Dr. Binswanger. This was an incredible talk. Um, since the topic of gun control came up, I was wondering if you had just thought at all about uh, the limits of, say, you know, military hardware, tanks, um, you know, nuclear weapons, so forth. Well, what, what's the role of government there? Well, that, it's, it falls under the system I, I um, developed. If, some, if your neighbor buys a functioning tank, <laughs> okay, that's a clear and present danger to you. And there would be probable cause, since there's no rational reason to have an operational tank, the only reason you could have it is to destroy... Uh, you know, the innocent, um, the police would stop him. Now, contrast that with a nuclear device. There are rational reasons to have a nuclear device. I remember this from the 50s when Eisenhower had his Atoms for Peace program. Dam building, mining, everything you use dynamite for, you can use a small nuclear device for better. Of course, you can't do it today. Uh, you should be able to, but if the, you know, Ajax Mining Company in Minnesota, in the, or is it Michigan, the Wasabi Range, Wasabi, Mo, whatever, if they buy it in the course of what they're doing, that's not a threat. Again, if Wild Willie, your neighbor in Austin, buys a nuclear device, that's a threat. So it's just a simple, obvious thing of what is a threat and what is not. But you wouldn't pass a law saying no one can buy a nuclear device. Or if you buy a nuclear device, a board has to license that first. There's, there's nothing good accomplished by boards supervising things in advance. There's a lot of things good accomplished by like stop and frisk in New York, where if there's suspicious behavior by an individual, at a certain time, you can stop, stop him, the police can stop him, and frisk him to see if he's got a weapon. That, that accomplished a lot because there was probable cause. Uh, Peter Schwartz always reminds me that the amount of force the government uses is proportionate to the evidence of the threat and how serious the threat is. So there are things that can create suspicion, like 
it's late at night and a guy in shabby clothes wearing gang colors is looking into the window of a jewelry store or a liquor shop, looking around him in, uh, you know, see if he's being seen. That's suspicious behavior. A cop, you can't throw him in jail for that, but a cop could stop him and say, what are you doing here? What's your business? And maybe frisk him if he looks suspicious enough. So it's not the case that you're talking about either you execute the guy or you let him do whatever you know, looks bad. A given degree of evidence of a given degree of harm warrants a given degree of intervention. And that's an important, it's like the punishment must fit the crime, you know, it's proportion, the amount of force that can be used is proportional to the discounted value of the harm, discounted by the evidence. So uh, did that, I, I don't even remember your question anymore. I, <laughs> that absolutely answered it, thank you. Okay, thank you. Right, uh, um, only one line up, yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, before I ask my question, I'd just like to point out that during your presentation, several people's phones went off, and it wasn't because they were irresponsible, it was actually because of the Amber Alert regulation that forces uh, a warning to play through your phone regardless of if, if it's on quiet or not. Um, so that was just an example of how it can be a nuisance. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but my, my question is, um, uh, I would also posit that uh, regulation in a field, uh, not only does it destroy innovation, but it also destroys even the current uh, knowledge in that field because it, um, it puts the onus of safety, like for my experience, uh, my field of uh, structural engineering, it puts the onus of safety and design of a building on the regulator who gives the, the codes and practices that you have to follow rather than the structural engineer's real knowledge of yeah. what they're building. So it makes their knowledge inoperative. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I, I lived in Manhattan when they finally legalized or deregulated structural concrete, you know, concrete with rebars in it. It was not allowed until about 1962. And then immediately a bunch of buildings went up using uh, reinforced concrete, I guess is what you call it, uh, in, in Manhattan. But of course, elsewhere it had been used for some time. Uh, so the, even if the board eventually approves the new thing, You've lost years waiting for it. And, and of course, what it does to the minds of the people who have to live with that regulation. I read an article 20 years ago in an objectivist publication that said to put up a home in California requires 200 permits. From the, the author had researched it. Of course, California is an outlier, right? And I won't say anything negative about California because my best friend lives there, but uh, I want to. <laughs> um, the, uh, the amount of mental damage that that does, where you know that you have to spend months, maybe a year, getting all those permits. Like going to the Department of Motor Vehicles 200 times before you can build a home. I mean, it, it, that in itself is a huge negative. Uh, you remember the crisis of um, 2008, the subprime and, and so forth crisis? Everybody says, well, we need regulation to prevent that kind of thing from happening. It was regulation that caused it. And there was a guy named Harry Markowitz who wrote the SEC three separate letters saying, I think Bernie Madoff is a fraud. And here's my reason. It was ignored. So one thing that regulatory protective boards do is not protect you where you should be protected. Because they have other motives. Uh, you heard uh, Dr. Adelja say that the politicization 
of the CDC has warped it tremendously. But it has to be politicized. Every government bureau has to be politicized. How could it not be? Okay. We, uh, we have a question from online. Online? Yes. Uh, the questioner asks, when does the pollution of toxic chemicals become a violation of rights? When you can prove it in court. Simple question. He's thinking specifically of uh, heavy metals such as lead and gasoline. Um, now, there, there, is a, there is an actual technical question about what do you do about putting stuff into the air, which in small quantities is okay, but after a certain level begins to be dangerous or harmful in other ways. It's pretty clear that, you know, if your wash hanging on the line gets soot on it from a factory 500 yards away that's belching smoke, you can act it, you can get an injunction, you can get compensation, and that will be stopped. But it's not so clear like uh, you're selling gasoline with lead in it, and lead builds up in the atmosphere, and at a certain point, it's declared unsafe. Except there is no, the question is, where is that point? And the government can set a limit beyond which, if you do this, it's force. In other words, if the concentration of lead in the air is, let's take a number, 100 parts per million, that's where it starts, medical experts testify, that's where it starts getting dangerous. Then you can say no new emissions, new emissions, the present emissions are okay if it's below 100, but no new emissions can come in if it raises the level above that. That's the most difficult technical question I can think of because there's no property rights in the air. I mean, you don't own a parcel of air. But that, it, it's, it's handled through the courts, right? And law and decisions are made with expert testimony. And that's the best you can do. Is that Che? Yep. Um, so this is probably its own lecture. But you mentioned, you know, you use the phrase unacceptable risk when you're talking about getting an injunction. Oh, you noticed that. Because <laughs> yes. that was a slip. <laughs> and I heard my, in my mind, unacceptable to whom, right? <laughs> By what standard? Well, that was somewhat my next question. How, do you have any thoughts, any like quick high level principles of like what sort of risk is a statistical? What, what are we talking about when we say risk of a harm? And what, is it, what are the standards? Well, um, all I have is that it's a non-negligible, higher than background risk that a reasonable man can recognize. He may have to be informed by expert testimony, but that goes on in court every day. And uh, the, you err on the side of freedom. So for instance, uh, I just, wrote a post for HBL, my uh, membership site that sends out emails, available at popular prices. <laughs> uh, I just wrote a post about if you get the vaccine, since 100 million people have had the mRNA vaccines in this country alone, 100 million, and we uh, haven't heard of, uh, the CDC doesn't recognize more than maybe a thousand cases of bad reaction. If you divide a uh, hundred million by a thousand, you get a hundred thousand. So you might perform this calculation. It's not a, it's pretty sloppy as to statistics, but just for a rough, rough, rough gauge. Maybe you face a one in 100,000 chance of having a bad reaction. I went on to show you have a much higher chance of getting COVID and dying, but that's not the point. 
A one in 100,000 risk does not rise above the background. It does not come above the noise level of the risk you have of falling down stairs, of choking on a ham sandwich like Mama Cass. You know, there are risks that, that are in the background that you don't even think about. And if you start saying, well, wait, this is one in 100,000, you'd be surprised how many other one in 100,000 calculated by the same means, that same kind of chug and plug division of statistics. More people die, I believe, in bathtub <laughs> accidents than in any other thing in the home, any other home-related, you know, including going up on the roof to fix tiles. So the, the trick is the thing you look at seems to loom large. And if you don't look at, oh, the other things I'm not looking at, you don't realize that. You say, but wait a minute, when in 100,000, there's still there's this guy. I know a guy whose uncle had a bad reaction, and he died. Yeah, but you know a lot of people who know a lot of people who didn't die, and you're ignoring that. This was the... I learned with the 1950 Plymouth, Blue Plymouth convertible. When I was 15, my friend got, was given a 1950 Blue Plymouth convertible. Now this is in 1959, so it's not like so far old at that time. Suddenly this, they were all over the streets. 19, <laughs> oh look, there's one just like Phil's. Oh, there's another. It, and, you know, there's a confirmation bias or whatever it is where you, your attention is drawn to something and suddenly it's everywhere and it seems much more important than if your attention had been drawn to another thing that is actually even more common and you never would have noticed the first thing. So one in 100,000 is just too little to care about. I draw the line at one in 10,000 myself, but you, you can draw your own line. And of course, it's very contextual. Um, so the, the answer is you, you have to have a non-negligible, like one in a trillion doesn't exist. That's not a risk. Above the background, for me, that's one in 10,000, risk that a reasonable man would recognize. That's my standard. Thank you. But acceptable was not a was not a good. You know, I reached and I came up with yeah, acceptable. Uh, go ahead. Hi. Good morning. Thank you very much for for your talk. It was very interesting. So I'm from Mexico. Um, I there killed anybody recently? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, you can tell. So, uh, there are always earthquakes in my country. In Mexico City, there are always earthquakes. Uh, in 1985, there was a huge earthquake. Uh, unfortunately, many buildings went down, many people died. Uh, after that, the, re the government regulations in constructions and buildings uh, increased considerably. Um, after that, of course... And, of course, Mexicans were far too stupid to make their buildings stronger themselves. They, but they were smart enough to elect the officials who appointed the board that made them do that. So, you see the contradiction there? Yeah, so there was another earthquake recently in 2017. A lot of people claim that thanks to the government regulations, then... Um, the rate of people that die or the buildings uh, have decreased considerably and they say because of the government regulations. However, there was this very famous case in Mexico City of a school um, and it was very famous because um, the owner of the school was sent to jail. Apparently, it was found that she was not complying with the government regulations, so um, like that was basically the reason why many other buildings went down as well. But she was accused of murder and now she is in jail uh, with a sentence for life. So I was wondering, um, do you think this person, the owner of this school, should be accountable 
of the kids that die, or the professors that die, and how would it look like in a free capitalist, idealist, idealistic society, um, like to prevent these these things from happening? Apart from yeah, of course, if you if you own a building, then you should you make you should ensure that it's like well, well constructed, you said et cetera. It. You, you you just said it inadvertently. You should ensure. Yes, and an insurance company would give, and the, even under regulation, they do give a much stricter inspection than any government building inspector would do. So the answer is private insurance and the mind of man. Nobody wants his building to fall down. It's not government regulations that improved the quality of a building. It was the knowledge of people about what you needed to do, given that there were earthquakes. You know this building that um, just fell down in Florida, Surfside, I think it is? Uh, I, read, uh, I read about it, and it's, uh, it was mixed. I mean, I don't think they've quite gotten to the bottom of it. But apparently it was built according to 1980 building codes, and they didn't know in 1980, even our omniscient government didn't know in 1980 that if a building faced the Atlantic then salt ions or sodium and chlor chloride ions I think particular would gradually get in if you didn't waterproof that front and eat away at the concrete and the rebar. Now there were also charges that they didn't use enough concrete or didn't use enough rebar uh, cut corners, and I don't know if that's true. But the main thing was the building, it wasn't weatherproofed. And it faced the Atlantic, and the salt got in and ate it up. And that was the state of knowledge at that point. The government code did not include what it now includes with later knowledge. So it's knowledge that saves lives, not government enforcing of knowledge. Now, should, should the woman who cheats on it uh, go to jail? I would say yes, if she put up, if, if it was negligent, if you prove. But I doubt that this happens. She's probably being scapegoated. But if you can prove that she knowingly put up a shoddy building for some ul ulterior motive, and people are killed as a result of it falling down, then she's responsible. I wouldn't call it murder, but it's negligent manslaughter. So it's not, a, it's not like a government regulation either transforms dangerous stuff into safe stuff or makes you, gives you a get out of jail free ticket if you uh, defy the regulations, you know, that's like the people who won't wear the mask because the government tells them not, I'm not, forget the mask because I'm not a mask guy. But they won't get the vaccine because they think people are telling them you've got to get the vaccine. Oh, and no, I'm not going to get it because you're telling me. To. That's as irrational as I'm going to get it because they're telling me to. You have to make up your own mind on the evidence and not, you know, the fact, if the government were to require it, that would not be a reason one way or another about whether you get the vaccination. Please get the vaccination. Next question. Another online question? Online question? Yeah, we have several questioners asking whether you would advocate vetting at the border for any reason under any circumstances. And some instances that have been raised are uh, immigration from heavily conservative Islamic countries or from areas there where organized crime flourishes and there are a lot of mafias? Uh, no, I would not, but the, we're talking about an ideal society. In an ideal society, there are no laws that permit the mafia to function. Mafia functions because prostitution is illegal, gambling in some places is illegal, it got started with prohibition. Uh, and drugs being illegal creates most of the crime in the world, certainly in the US. 
you're almost never on a criminal case in New York unless it's drug related, drug, drug issue. Um, I was told, and I want to believe it, so I do, that <laughs> doctors can, you know, who can get heroin or, or, or narcotics, uh, cocaine, they can get cocaine freely as doctors because it has medical uses. That for doctors, the price of these drugs is the same as aspirin. Well, you don't notice aspirin gangs, you know, Colombian aspirin lords who are filling up the stomachs of dogs with aspirin in bag, little bags to get them across the border. It's the illegal, I, you, you know this point probably, it's the illegalization of drugs that drives the price of the drugs up and creates profit op opportunities. They, the, laws against sin are what create the mafia. They would have nothing to, to offer uh, beyond regular beatings up uh, if there weren't, illegal activities that people want to engage in that are victimless crimes. That uh, then the price of them goes up and honest businessmen cannot provide them. So uh, that is part of the answer. Would I have vetting? Now again, we're talking about an ideal society. You can argue, I, you know, I'm against vetting even today, but there, is, there are reasonable people who disagree with me and there are good arguments on their side too. But in a, a capitalist society, it should be welcome to the United States, just like it says welcome to Connecticut when you drive across the border from New York State. There should be no installations. There should be no such thing as a border, border guard. Now, if you're Israel, that's another example of today versus the ideal situation. You can't do any of this stuff in Israel that's surrounded by people at war with them, in effect, that were launching rockets and blowing up their people uh, from the Arab countries daily. So uh, obviously, if you're not in a situation where you're at peace with, with other people, you can't do this. But in a uh, future world that, as I say, is more, it, it's like two, even three years off, will have a rational foreign policy and will be so much richer than any other nation because they're capitalist, you know, will have laser uh, sabers and, and no one would dream, you wouldn't have a problem, oh, well, what if terrorists come across the border? There, no terrorists would dare to attack a laissez-faire country. They wouldn't dare. Uh, and not if they were the representative of some organized group. A, a crazed individual would do it, but not, you know, the PLO or Al-Qaeda or whatever organized group. And it, if once it happened, that would be the end of that region of the world where it came from. So audiologists, uh, you know, who, who do nothing that you couldn't do yourself at home get large salaries because of the regulations and the, and the banks. There are banks that profit from the regulation. So I think that's the reason. I, don't think, I think socialization of risk is a collectivist notion. I know you don't mean it as collectivism. You're saying it as a criticism. But I think the very concept is made up um, in order to uh, divert attention away from individuals and what they're doing. So no, I don't accept that terminology. Question it, challenge that premise. Uh, right, and that, that's actually my point, that I, we oh, should, oh, I, good. I, I do not agree <laughs> with that, but I guess the, the response of, well, that's a violation of individual rights or that causes moral hazard, the typical response would be, well, that's a risk society should be willing to take because it kind of gives this social uh, you know, and I, I'm wondering what the right, like is individual rights and moral ha hazard, the response yeah, is that how's it? that working for you? You know that phrase? How's that working for you? How, how did that work in the uh, pandemic? How did that work in the subprime uh, uh, collapse? How did that work with Bernie Madoff? How did that work in the Great Recession where the government had terrific powers over the economy through the Federal Reserve, which was established in 1913. Uh, 
all, the, all these things fail, 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 fail. And that never stops them. Why? Because the basic issue is government officials have no selfish interest in their rulings. But the beasts who go after profit are only concerned with their own selfish greed and don't care anything about other people. So government officials are motivated by love. They're unselfish. They have no dog in the fight, so to speak. But private individuals are crooked, sorted, and ulcers, and bespotted. That's the premise that's operating. It's nothing else. And then mo wheels oiled by the pressure groups who benefit from the regulations. Did you know, like, organized crime always fights the decriminalization of their <laughs> revenue stream. So if you start a movement to legalize drugs, that will be opposed by the mafia. This is, this, uh, is another one of those things that I've heard and I like, so I believe it. I can't document it, but <laughs> take, it, take it as, let, let's put it this way. If they don't, they're stupider than I thought they were. Their self-interest is to keep everything illegal. That's the point, whether they recognize the self-interest. Now, there I mean self-interest in the narrow sense I'm arguing against on HBL. So it's, it's not in their self-interest. And their self-interest is to go say, please arrest me. I deserve to be in jail. OK, uh, next With question. We another from online. So the questioner is asking about open carry laws and asks, uh, is there a situation where you can go into a grocery store and see a holstered cowboy pushing a grocery cart, a case of an open and objective threat? Uh, I think it depends on the context. Uh, I hope everyone could hear the question. You know, open carry, uh, uh, if you go into a store and people are carrying a holstered gun, or, or lowered rifle or something. There are parts of the country where this is routine. And it, it, no one would feel threatened. Uh, there are parts of the country where maybe due to regulation, it's not routine and you should feel threatened. Uh, in the old west, in the movies, everybody's wearing guns. Now there's always a gunfight, but that. <laughs> The good guys always win, so. <laughs> I mean, no, I don't, uh, I think it would depend upon, you know, you'd have to go to court if you felt threatened and make a case that this is extraordinary, that this, the mere fact that he's got a gun holstered, there's no reason for it other than to kill someone or to force someone, and therefore it's a threat. But where there is a reason, and it's routine, it's not a threat. So that would be a matter of what you can prove in court in that area. Yes. Hello. In my model of decision making, what a rational person does is they account for the lasting impact of their actions and how it relates to other systems in question. Uh, when we're working with irrational people, they can do a partial, they can do part of that analysis, but it won't be complete. Um, and so how, do you, how would you optimally organize irrational people to come to the same value-creating conclusions that a rational person would come to? And like, what are your- put, put them in a society where the irrational can't chain the rational and they'll learn by, the, by what happens to the rational or the irrational. Let them see the consequences of rationality and irrationality. So uh, the other answer is, I have no plan for the irrational. I leave them to heaven. <laughs> I'm not in charge of the irrational. I used to be, but I gave them. So, okay, so that's a good long-term analysis, but in the short term, uh, we, we would want the, to maximize, or I, I at least would want to maximize the value that uh, the more irrational people are providing, so that can be exchanged in a market exchange. One way of doing that is by imposing all the 
individual considerations that the rational person would do through things like uh, the regulations. So how can you, so that's what that, when you impose regulations but on somebody. A regulation is a gun pointed at somebody and saying, do it my way, not the way you think is best. That's what a regulation is. My way or the highway by force. That can't improve things. That can only deprove things. <laughs> Degrade things. And it, that's what it has done. Uh, that's why you see me with uh, white hair and wrinkled skin rather than looking young because of the regulations on medicine. I seem to be fixated on that, don't I? <laughs> When you, when you get old, you get constant feedback that you are old, and it's not pleasant. I'm interested in that, too. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for an outstanding talk. All I have to say about it is amen. Is that um, Tomer? It is Tomer. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> yes, uh, um, thank you. I think the um, issues you brought up are closely related to the problem of externalities. So. Normally, whenever there is force, there is a clear initiator as well as a clear victim. So, for example, if I walk down the street and somebody steals my wallet, I didn't want anything to do with that person, and yet that person uh, initiated uh, mm -hmm. his interaction with me. However, there are cases in which when people live close to each other, they affect each other just by the very uh, fact of their existence. So, just by going about their lives, um, they can have some influence you know, or even a harmful influence on my life. The classic example is obviously pollution. Um, the factory that produces good is obviously not trying to poison me uh, and yet the pollution has some effect on me. Now I think I know your position on pollution but there may be other cases that are less obvious uh, than that. So no, and, and there aren't and the, um, the general answer is uh, twofold property rights, so you can do what you want on your land and you can have other people who enter your land obey the conditions you set. And the other is nuisance is a violation of the right to peaceful enjoyment of your values. So if somebody's next door on his land playing loud music, uh, it gets to a certain degree of unavoidability you can take him to court. That, that is depriving you of the reason why you have your house, uh, the peaceful enjoyment of your values. So yes, nuisance is suable for. Um, but you know, this is kind of like the abortion argument. When you argue about abortion, you will be confronted with, well, what is the magic in the moment after the umbilical, whatever line you set, the moment the head emerges from the womb or the moment the umbilical cord is cut, as opposed to the moment before, how can you def And the answer is, what is the magic about the moment the sperm enters the egg as opposed to the moment before? That's the question. Don't let yourselves be sucked in to discussing the seconds around birth when the issue is abortion in the first month. That's the, that's the real issue. And if they're gonna go mystical about what happens when the sperm enters the egg, that is right after conception, there's no point in discussing what happens in the ninth month. They are outside the realm of reason, and you should point that out in a nice way to them. Like, hey, did you realize you're outside the realm of reason? <laughs> You probably didn't notice, but you left reason way back there. <laughs> In the same way, don't let a discussion of regulation get to, well, what if he's playing his uh, country music at 35 decibels and I don't enjoy my backyard as much. Yeah, it's not deafening or anything. And yeah, I could wear earplugs, but why should I? Don't, that's not the discussion. The discussion is, I developed in two hours a cure, a vaccine, not cure, vaccine for COVID, and now I have to wait a year for the government to approve it while people die. The, 
I, I learned from Adam Mossoff that the, um, what is that called? Uh, something tech, uh, Bion Tech uh, company, the one that licensed to Pfizer, and we now know the Pfizer vaccine is developed by Bion Tech, a small tech company. They did it in two hours. I thought it was 48 hours, which is what Moderna took, but they did it in two. And uh, sure, they have to, you know, do a couple of animal tests. And yes, they have to get a couple of human volunteers, but that's almost pro forma. If you know how mRNA works, you know it's going to be safe, and you know it's going to work. Um, in this case, anyway, because of the nature of the spike protein. Uh, so uh, all these deaths since January, well, let's give them till March to go through the tests that they would want to do. All the deaths since March are due to government, due to government forbidding them from selling this. Um, so that's the issue. The issue is the State Science Institute and the gun pointed at the head of Reardon and Dagny, that, uh, the anthem, the hero breaking free of his chains. It's not, well, what if he plays country music louder than I would like on his land? Don't even discuss it. Um, I do agree with you that this is not uh, relevant to uh, COVID policy, and I wasn't suggesting that it is. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, there may be cases that are more uh, complex than uh, whether are, uh, you should some... lock everyone at home to protect everyone from uh, contracting are, this if they go are, out of home. That's why we have courts, and that's why we have you know, <clears throat> a discussion of these borderline cases and, and difficult cases. But they're not, the, they're not where we live. They're not important. They're important to the litigants, but I don't think that we have to be worried about them. Let me say something in immigration about sovereignty, because not everybody, I guess, not everybody's on HBL and has seen my breakthrough statement on that. We have to guard our borders. We have to protect our borders. We have to protect American sovereignty. No. No, it's not your borders, and all the sovereignty means is that our police force doesn't allow the Mexican police force to you know, operate within the United States. That's all that sovereignty means. It means our government rules here. It doesn't mean you and I get to decide who can come into somebody else's land on the border or who can use public streets. It means we won't allow the other countries that surround us to enforce their law within this territory. So it's a government's exclusive jurisdiction. It's a jurisdictional issue. It's not ownership. And on the flip side, on a positive direction, you know the vilification of the United States for, oh, we took this land from Mexico. California used to be Mexico. There's a movement to return it. You know, Texas. Here we are in Texas. We took it from Mexico. Well, good. <laughs> that means the people living in that area had their rights protected. It means instead of being shaken down by dictatorial government, they had a free government that stopped them from being shaken down by anybody. So there's not... To, to, to extend jurisdiction is not to change anybody's ownership. It's to change which police force operates in that area. And sometimes, if it's a better police force, it's a good idea, and people there will welcome it. It's not, well, the United States government, which is this one cloud, came over and took from the Mexican people or government, which is another collective entity, part of its being. No, it meant that Jose, living in what is now Austin, was no longer hassled by the security agents or whoever they were of the Mexican government. Now he was hassled by our government. No. <laughs> Back then he wasn't hassled. Back then he had his rights protected. It's not... It's not there's no such thing, oh, Mexico owned it, 
and then the U.S. took it. Mexico didn't own it. And the Indians, okay, I won't get off on the Indians. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you, Tomer. Uh, when you were talking about the example of setting a fire on my land that might go wild, uh, it made me think that, well, there, one thing I might get from regulation is a, is a standard that, like, if I were to, take, to be taken to court, I would kind of, I could expect that this is the standard that would mm -hmm. be used in court that mm -hmm. would be more specific to that, you know, not just the general standard of is it a threat, but let's, we're going to have to do this work every single time we go to court to figure out, like, is that, is that fire a threat? So yeah. it would something, if we take away the preventive prosecution, would there be some other thing that yes. says, here's a whole bunch of standards that we can use you know, in these common situations in court? Yes, that's a good question. Uh, as a reasonable pushback, uh, I've got an answer to it. Uh, I hope you all got the intent. Um, do we have to litigate these things de novo each time? And the answer is no. There's precedent, and there are general principles that the courts develop. A lot of the common law, take that back, all of the common law, which is a fantastic body of law developed in England, basically, uh, around, well, going back to medieval times and ending in about, I don't know, 1800 very rational system developed by the courts inductively in trying to settle disputes. And principles emerge. You're taught those principles in law school, right? Like what are the elements of contract? There has to be value exchange, meeting of the minds, and no, consider, valuable consideration, meaning in the minds of his third one, I don't remember. And these things are worked out over time. So yes, there would be, there would be um, the ability to say, well, this is like the settled principle that uh, a bonfire is any fire whose flames are higher than a man's head or something. I, you know, I... I'm not a bonfire expert, so I don't know what the rulings would be, but there would be settled rulings and precedents, but that would leave scope for a person to argue my case is different. A court is not, it just occurring to me, how is that different from a government board? A, a court is different from a government board of bureaucrats. Court has settled rules of evidence developed in this common law. They have principles, they have precedents, and they are not after power. They, there's no way they could exercise power. A body of regulators is in charge of you. It's a very different thing. And empirically, we can observe, you know, like a court is far superior to the FDA and the CDC. If you had to defend your rights, you wouldn't want to go to the FDA. You would want to go to, this, to a court, even today. With the, that's another whole subject. How much time do we have? <laughs> Essentially none, right? Zero is not a number. Have you been reading? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss a video.